Um, I'm going to share with you my personal story. You know, we've all got different stories here. Fantastic to hear yours. Great job. It's a big deal. Anybody standing up, talking to a crowd, and uh, yeah, absolutely fantastic job there. Um, and uh, and my story starts really from being uh, 17. As a 17 year old, I was di diagnosed with osteosarcoma, and uh, it meant that I had to go through all the stuff that we know about. I had the six months of chemotherapy, had my left leg amputated below the knee. You have to do this if you're an amputee. You to, it's like a rule, you have to do that. They tell you that when they first give you your leg. Um, and uh, and it, it was a, you know, it was a, tr it was a miserable time. But I did have this moment of inspiration when I, when I first got diagnosed where I suddenly thought to myself, I don't know if I've got six months to live, six years to live, or 60 years left to live. But what I do know is I want to make the most of my time. I want to try and be as good as I can be, whatever it is that I choose to do. And one of the things that I wanted to try and be as good as I could be at was swimming. And I'd been a, a lazy county swimmer as a teenager. As one of these really annoying kids who thought they were fantastic or whatever they did. But when it came to swimming, I would just turn up and I would talk to my mates. And I was never going to be any better than a county standard swimmer. But when I got diagnosed, I said to my dad, um, you know, I'd, uh, I'd like to see how good I can be now. You know, do you think there are some competitions out there for people with disabilities? Because we didn't know anything about this. It was a new world for us, this world of disability. And he said, I will find out for you. And he got onto the telephone and he entered me into the Disabled Swimming Nationals before I had my leg amputated. <laughs> so you think you've got difficult conversations to have, yeah? This one went a bit like this. Hello there, I'd like to enter my son into the, the Disabled Nationals, please. Certainly, sir, what's his disability? Hasn't got one yet. <laughs> that is a bit weird. But, but, but one of the things I've heard people talking about is, is having people around you that support you, that, that show belief in you. you know? And this is my father's way of showing belief in me. You know, because the parents here know what it's like. You, you have your child removed from you, don't you? But you want to show belief in them. And that's, that was his way of doing it. So he started coaching me um, about, uh, well, two days after I had the stitch out of my leg, so about eight days after my operation, and within six months, I was swimming quicker with one leg than before when I had two, and I've been a county standard swimmer. And within 18 months, I was lucky enough, good enough to go to the Paralympic Games in Seoul. And when I was there, I won two gold medals, a silver and two bronze medals. And I've... It, was, it was a massive turnaround for me, you know, and, uh, and it, you know, it, it, was, it was great to, to represent my country, uh, and, and winning medals was fantastic too, but almost more importantly for me was I, I was representing my family. It was a huge opportunity for me to give something back to them that supported me through this horrible time. Now something that I think is really important in life is I think it's really important to have a sense of humour. Would you all agree? Absolutely. And you especially need to have a sense of humour about yourself, don't you? If you can laugh at yourself and smile at yourself, life is a lot easier. Now I think the Paralympic team can do this better than any other group of people I have ever met. And I'm going to tell you a story that illustrates my sense of humour, but they've all got something similar going on. And uh, so when I first got diagnosed, I said to the people that, that made my artificial leg, I said, I'd like to try and go skiing within a year of having my leg amputated. Could you make me an artificial leg that would allow me to do that? They were like, absolutely, we will make you the best skiing leg ever. I go, oh great, thanks very much. So they started working on this leg and then a few weeks later, they presented it to me. I tried it on, it was very comfortable, but it was very, very heavy. They assured me it was only heavy because it had been reinforced and that's what made it the best skiing leg ever. Uh, okay, so I took it away and I went skiing with my brother. Now, unfortunately, because it was so heavy, it moved at a very different speed to my real leg. <laughs> And every time I turned to the left, the front of my skis crossed. Every time I turned to the right, the backs of my skis crossed. And eventually I had a big crash into a fence. And my, my brother skied down to, to me to see if I was okay. I was more or less okay. I winded myself, but I was okay. Then I looked down and I realised I've snapped my artificial foot and it's facing the wrong way around. Now, I thought that was the funniest thing I'd ever seen. <laughs> me and my brother were rolling around in the snow, nothing I'd say, but eventually I like, gathered myself and I walked down to the bottom of the hill, as you do when you've broken your leg. And I got to the bottom. There's a guy there looking after the cheerlift and I said, excuse me, can I sit on your chair? I was like, no, no, absolutely, sit down. And I sat down and I'm holding my leg up like this, but the foot's facing the other way around. <laughs> my brother's got hold of it and I'm saying, snap it back round, snap it back round. <laughs> People in the queue were green. <laughs> now I think that's funny, okay? And I think if I've, I, I've learned one thing from being part of the Paralympic team, and I, I know a lot of you guys will have learned this too, is that, is that if, if I can find a little bit of humour in something that's difficult to cope with, it actually goes a long, long way to helping you deal with that situation. You know, 
These guys, they're on the team, they live with disabilities day in, day out, they do it with a smile on their face, a great group of people, and it sees them through a lot of hard times. So, I wanted to try and be, uh, carry on swimming. I, I, went, I went to Barcelona, and I got a medal there, and, and I got a silver medal there, which wasn't bad, because I'd been, um, uh, I'd, I'd been trying to catch up with my friends. I'd missed a whole year of school, so I was a year behind my friends. I eventually got to university, but I, I um, but Barcelona hit at the same time as all my final exams and everything. I got the silver medal and I was like, ah, that's okay. But it wasn't what I set out to do at the beginning. I said I wanted to try and be as good as I could be at whatever I chose to do. And I didn't think a silver medal did it for me. And I wanted to, you know, I thought I could be better than that. And I realised I needed to, to be, needed to become a full-time athlete. And, um, and what that means for a swimmer means that you get up at 20 to 5 in the morning. Uh, you do two hours of swimming from half past five to half past seven. You do an hour and a half of gym work at lunchtime. You do another two hours um, of swimming in the evening. You know, so it's a, it's a, a lot of work. Um, so I became this full-time athlete, and uh, I was working towards um, going to Atlanta. Now I'm skipping through some of my swimming here because I know we're a bit we, we've lost some time today. Um, and um, by the time it came for me to go to Atlanta, I was trying to do three different events. The 400 freestyle, the 100 backstroke, and the medley relay, the 34 point relay. And uh, I, I say 34 points, you won't know, necessarily know what that means. I better quickly explain how Paralympic sport works, okay? In the swimming, there are 10 categories for people with a physical disability. I've got a physical disability. As a below the knee amputee, so I go into category 10. It's the minimal disability category. Goes down to category 1, category 2. There are people maybe with severe cerebral palsy, multiple amputations, high level spinal injuries. Now, I would never race against those guys because it would be unfair, wouldn't it? It'd be a bit like a heavyweight boxer fighting against a featherweight boxer. You know, the heavyweight would just go. Pfft. That'd be another fight. You know, they're both good boxers. They shouldn't ever fight with each other. And that's really how we should watch Pound Pit Sport. Just look at it, assume that somebody's made sure it's fair, then just enjoy the competition like you would any other competition. But there is, however, this one situation where we do, do come together. It's this thing called a 34-point relay. And you can make up those 34 points using your 10 categories and your four swimmers. So you guys are all pretty smart. You, you should be able to work this out. You could have, for example, a 7, an 8, a 9, and a 10. It makes 34. Okay, give me an easy one. <laughs> you, you could have two 10s, two 7s. That makes 34 as well. Okay? And there's a lot of gauges should be out of hand that these teams work. So I was getting ready to do these three events. The, the 400 freestyle, 100 backstroke medley relay, and I went to the Olympic trials with Helen Sheffield, which was uh, kind of weird for me because I had my leg amputated there, I had my chemotherapy there, and now I was trying to qual qualify for going to the to the games there. So a lot of stuff has gone on in Sheffield for me, and. Um, the first event for me to try and qualify for was the Freud of Freestyle. So I dived in, swimming along a little bit like this. And I got to the end and I touched the wall and I turned around and I looked at the scoreboard. And the scoreboard is about ten times the size of this screen. And on the scoreboard it said, Mark Woods, world record. I go, oh yeah, I like the sound of that. <laughs> it's got quite a nice ring to it, I thought. I was feeling really pleased with myself. I won the 100 backstroke too, so I'm automatically going to the games and I'm automatically in the relay. Fantastic. I go to Atlanta and in the morning of the final freestyle, I got to try and qualify for the final. So diving again, turn on again, get to the end, touch the wall, turn around, look at the scoreboard, and I can see that I'm the fastest qualifier. World record holder, fastest qualifier, things are looking great for tonight. Get to the final, diving again, turn on again, get to the end, touch the wall, turn around, look at the scoreboard, broken the world record, yes, came third. <laughs> well, how does that work exactly? And I turn around and I look at the scoreboard and I realise I've broken my old world record, but two people have broken it half a second before me and I conferred. And I was pretty disappointed. And um, there were a couple of things that athletes are very, very good at. The first thing they were good at is we're very good at, at listening to feedback. You know, whenever anybody says anything to me, you know, I'll always listen to it. You know, so if somebody comes up to me and says, Mark, I saw what you did there, it wasn't very good, was it? If you did it like this, it would be a lot better. For me, that's like, oh, thank you, thanks for telling me. You know, I know not, it doesn't feel like that for everybody sometimes. You, know, you don't always want to be told when you can be better. But for when you're an athlete, you want to be as good as you can be. And I uh, know we're, we're, as a charity, in the business of giving feedback aren't we, to, to, the, uh, to the medical profession in a lot of ways. And, and it can be pretty uncomfortable. We're going to have to think about how you do that to make it comfortable for GPs to hear this information and for consultants to hear this information. Um, There's something that you've got to think about. The other thing that we're very good at is, is reviewing what we do. And so when I, after I did this race where I was world record holder, fastest qualifier, I reviewed everything. 
And uh, after that process, I, I realized the thing that stopped me winning was my target. Now, targets can be really useful things, but sometimes targets work against you. And my target looked a bit like this. I thought to myself, you know, I'm the world record holder. Nobody has been as fast as me. If I do that time, I win the gold medal. Now, I know it sounds stupid. Now that I told you that I came third, but before, and it kind of made sense to me. But there were two of the people in that race who were thinking, we have never been as fast as that world record time. We've just got to be as good as we can be today. Then we have a chance. They were going as fast as they could. I couldn't see them. I was pacing myself to my time, but that time was irrelevant. And I ended up hitting my target, but missing my goal, if that makes sense. And, pe and people do this kind of thing all the time as well. And it was interesting in the session that we had uh, earlier on, hearing about some of the ideas that were, that were coming up. And there were some fantastic, fantastic ideas and, and great targets to work towards. But you've really got to make sure that they're in line with what your end destination is. Because they, they could be great, but they can suck a lot of energy away that you might end up not getting to where you want to go to. And I know I, I keep looking at the trustees when I'm talking, but uh, it, it's not just your responsibility, I know. But, but you, know, you want to really make sure that your targets are in line with your end destination as, you, as you're going through things. But so, it's pretty disappointing um, com uh, coming third in this race, but I think being a human being, certainly being an athlete, is all about picking yourself up and carrying on. Athletes wouldn't exist if they quit the first time they got beat, because you, you get knocked down a lot, but what you get good, up, good, good at is picking yourself up. And so the next day I raced again, I came second in that race, 100 backstroke, but it still wasn't what I trained for for four years. So it came down to this final race, the medley relay, the 34 point relay. Now in a second I'm going to play a piece of video for you. And there are two rules you need to know about when you watch this piece of video, they're not complicated, okay? First rule is, you need to pick a team to cheer for. Now I swim for Great Britain, but don't let that sway you in any way. It's totally up to you. Really don't mind who you cheer for, okay? Second rule is far more important than rule number one, is you cheer for me anyway when I swim. Now I go last in this race, you've got a basic choice, whether save your voice, cheer for me in the end. Or you warm your voice up, cheer for me in the end. I will point it out when I dive in, okay? I can see you all looking at me thinking I'm not going to cheer, but we're going to give it a go, okay? <laughs> so play the clip please, that one. The final of the men's 4x100 metres medley relay, and with only one event to come after this, an event that the German team are certain to win, there has never been a more crucial race for Great Britain. Great Britain must win this in order to stay in third position. Okay, okay. you can still hear me in the back, guys. Great Britain. Yeah. Okay, so do you understand what the commentator was saying there? Great Britain and Germany, nick and neck on the medal table for the entire game. Whoever wins this is going to go third. The whole of the British have come down to watch like we needed more pressure. So there are your choices. Lane number two. Anybody going to cheer for America? Leading off the Great Britain. <laughs> Fantastic. Lane six should have been America. They didn't oh, turn up. I like to think they were scared. <laughs> now, they had an injury in their team, so they had to withdraw. That's why lane six is empty. The team from the United States. Now, you see the guy in the middle here doing double arm backstroke. He's a category six swimmer. He's got mild cerebral palsy. His team will have some stronger swimmers coming through later on as they make up those 34 points I talked about. Great Britain, Germany, or Spain. Three guys at a line there. You got Norway, then Germany, then Great Britain. They're all above the knee amputees. They're all category nine swimmers. That's why they're swimming at a similar speed. The British Paralympic team. Anybody want to cheer for Norway? No. Fantastic, because the rest of their team was pants. This was their, this was their big moment, and we weren't too worried about Norway. The Kimmich of Germany. And I'm going last this race, and going last is fantastic when the team is doing well. Because you start thinking to yourself, oh yes, I'm going to dive in love with Germany, I'm going to swim past, touch a wall first, win the gold medal, get all the glory. It's going to be fantastic. So I was really happy with how close to Germany we were. Norway there, then Germany, then Great Britain. Norway might lead. The first handover. But going next for Germany we'll hand over to Ian is a guy called Stefan Loeffler. Now, Stefan used to be a good, good friend of mine. Second place. <laughs> Norway in first. Uh, but he did some incredibly quick mistake. He's in for Great Britain there in second position. And the Germans with Stefan Loeffler in third You'll position. You'll see him in a second. That, that's Stefan there with the shaved head. He's got one hand missing from the wrist. You wouldn't think it, what's doing swim there. Absolutely amazing breaststroke swimmer. And I'm watching people thinking, blimey, Stefan's going fast. And suddenly, going last isn't such a good position to be going. Don't worry about how much work we've got left to do. Making a British guy look like he's going backwards. Reminiscent of uh, Frederick de Burgrave of Belgium, who won the 100 uh, breaststroke in the Olympic Games. 
It's Germany, Great Britain, Norway, now in third position. Ian Matthews, the British best stroker with an awful lot to do. Stefan Leufler. Now sometimes it's really good, you can't hear the commentator say things like that. But I was actually thinking we didn't have an awful lot left to do. <laughs> Matthews will hand over to Giles. Especially he's going next for Germany is a guy called Detlef Schmidt. Now, Detlef is what he called a hand before trying to He's half dead to the hitch. As a consequence, he, he hardly ever wears an artificial leg. He always walks around on his crutches. He's built like a mountain. That's a huge guy. That's him diving there. And I'm expecting him to go even further into the lead. Matthews hands over but going next uh, for Great Britain is a guy who some of you will know, a guy called Giles Long. So I think he's, he's yeah. so you know Giles? Giles, I think he had a U in the last is that right? I think, I think he had, he had, a, he had a, 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 a type of bone cancer. So of Germany and Great he had operations to remove the tumour that means that once it's been removed and rebuilt, he can move his arm like this, he can move his arm like that, but he can't move his arm above his head. So he swims one-armed butterfly. Now that's quite difficult, okay? There's, there's one-armed butterfly there. Coming into third now is it's actually somebody doesn't have all the attributes you think he'd need to be good at his job. He's not a big, tall, muscly guy, but he's worked at being technically brilliant to what he does. And he actually starts catching up a little bit on Germany. Two strokes, keeping the body nice and flat. That's Julie there. You'll see Jars in a second. Not preventing him from swimming superb butterfly. He'll hand over to Oliver. Right, there's Jars there. Now I've noticed you've been terrible at number one, okay, but <laughs> number two is about to come into operation because I'm about to dive in and I am going to point it out. So get ready. I know, that wasn't me. Hold on. I dive in. No! Very good. Israel have gone into third position. That's Jeremy there. That's, that's me at the top there. This is the German. Oliver Anders. Here's Mark Woods for Great Britain. And Woods going like a train at this first 50. Mark Woods for Great Britain. Woods has pulled back about three or four metres off the first At about this point, I turn around and read that. And you can see the guy's feet. No, just stop. He's pulled straight down one way. I think I can do that. I can do that. I'm going to catch up. 50 from Mark Woods. Remember, whoever wins this race will finish third. The overall medals title, and back comes Mark Woods for Great Britain. We're inside the final 25 now. Woods has pulled back seven metres. There's only a half a metre in it now. Mark Woods of Great Britain is getting on level two with Oliver Anders of Germany. And he's just holding on. Oh, 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 Anders gets it. 12 hundredths of a second. We got the beat by 12 one hundredths of a second. Closer. Now if you spread that over four years of preparation, it goes very thinly indeed. I actually think I touched on it, it's just a little bit too late to argue about it now. Mark Woods the race of his life, and possibly having the race of They're going to show a shot of the four guys we've seen after we've seen our silver medals. And I want you to look at the four faces of the guys we've seen. Ignore the French group of my head. Just look at the four faces of the guys we've seen. Medley relay team. But only good enough to win silver in 441.62. The team of Ewan, Matthews, Here we go. From left Watt, right. and Woods. Got a happy guy. Then yet a another season. Guy. A British happy team guy. here in Atlanta. And a sad guy. <laughs> I was pretty disappointed. Can you imagine what that felt like? You know, I really thought we had a team that could do it. And to lose by such a small margin. But like I said before, whenever we do anything, we always review what we do. And I went through everything, looked at how I trained, looked at how the other guys trained. Uh, did we eat the right food? Did we get to Atlanta in time to get over the jet lag, get used to the humidity? And it wasn't until I watched that video back, and I saw the four guys on the team stood there with their silver medals around their necks, and I saw happy guy, sad guy, happy guy, sad guy. I thought to myself, what are you two smiling at? We lost. Why is that a good result? And at that moment in time, it just dawned on me, we had a group of individuals who had totally different objectives. And when you've got that kind of thing going on, you're really unlikely to achieve your true potential. And I would say to you guys here, 
Whether, whether you're an amputee who has to work with a prosthetist, or whether you're a charity that's trying to work with consultants, or, or whatever you're trying to do, you really need to try to agree on the best possible outcome. You know, what is it that you're trying to achieve? You know, because if you don't get some agreement on that, then you are unlikely to ever be as good as you can be. And that's what we failed to do, was to believe in the best possible outcome. And I, I, was, I was pretty cross with myself, because I was like the unofficial leader of this team. Uh, but my leadership style wasn't very good. I used to go up to people and say, we can win the gold medal. And they'd look at me and go, yeah, right, yeah, yeah. But, but two were thinking we could, and two were thinking, yeah, we might. But as long as I go home with a piece of metal and a ribbon, I don't mind what the colour is. I totally failed to realise that's what they were thinking. Because I, I thought communication was a one-way process that came out the end of my finger. I didn't realise I needed to listen to what people were saying to me. Didn't even give them a chance to talk to me some of the time. Do you know anybody like that? Don't look at them now. Don't look at them now. <laughs> look, now everybody started looking over here. I don't know. Where. I'm joking. I'm joking. You know, and, and you know, so I was pretty. I was pretty cross with myself for not not getting agreement, not giving people chance to talk to me. There's this old Greek saying, you know, you, you're given two of these and one of these, use them in the same proportion. You know, and that's what I totally failed to do. You can probably tell that I like talking, but I just wasn't so good at listening. And uh, so I was pretty cross with myself at not getting everybody to believe in the best possible outcome. And uh, I thought, well, I'll try and go to another games. Next, um, next games was going was gonna to be Sydney. And uh, I'm going to focus on the relay, because that's my best chance of, of winning a, a gold medal. I'm going to forget about my individual races, especially the freestyle relay, look like it was going to be great. But most importantly, I'm going to fo focus on getting to know the other people on my team. You know, and again, like I say, get to know the people that really matter to you, you know, that are helping you do what you want to do, whether you are an amputee or whatever. Um, I'm going to start having conversations with them. What were their hopes? What were their fears? Have they had any fears? Could I remove those fears for them? Because fears are quite strange things, aren't they? It can be quite difficult to deal with your own fear, but it can be relatively easy to support somebody through theirs. You know, we, we were talking about that earlier on, about let's, let's, this is why this is great. You know, it, it's, it's helping each other, talking about things that we've all dealt with and, su and supporting each other. Um, I'll give you an example of the kind of conversations that I used to have. Uh, we went to the European Championships in 1999. They're held in a town called Braunschweig in Germany. And um, on the team that year was a guy called Matt Walker. Now, Matt's got mild cerebral palsy. So what that means for him on a day-to-day -day basis is he tremors all the time. Whether he's talking or walking or eating or drinking, he tremors all the time. It's an exhausting lifestyle for Matt. This makes him a Category 7 swimmer. That year we had two tens, two sevens, making up our 34 points. And um, before this race, I said to Matt, is there anything you're worried about? He says, well, there is actually. I'm a bit worried about doing the relay changeover. Because Matt would always go in the middle of our race. Because the way, the way teams normally work is you have your fastest guy goes last, your second fastest goes first, your two slowest people, you hide in the middle, hope nobody notices. Okay? <laughs> well, that's how our team works anyway. So Matt would always go in the middle. And uh, he said, I'm worried about doing the relay changeover. I said, well, why, Matt? You've got to dive in at some point. He says, well, it's not that. He said, I get onto the block, and I'm trying to control my tremor. And at the same time, I'm trying to anticipate the person coming towards me. And I find it a difficult thing to do. Could you think that anticipation would be easy, wouldn't you? You've seen this on TV. First person, you wait for the gun to go. Second, third, and fourth, your lads will already be moving. As long as you're still on the block, when the other person touches, that's fine. So I said, you know, well, what's so difficult about it? He says, well, I'm on the block, and I'm trying to control my tremor. And at the same time, I'm trying to anticipate this person coming towards you. I do find it a difficult thing to do. Because when people are tired, they don't always do their job as well as they might, do they? You find that in the NHS. You know, where there are a lot of tired people out there. They don't always do the job as well as they might. And um, not looking at anybody in particular. If I looked at you then, I'm really sorry. It wasn't a deliberate thing. And um, so I said, well, why are we making you do this? You know, why are we making you do a relay changeover? You know, when you, you, you're trying to control your tremor. Why don't you go first? If you go first, you can... Hold on somebody's arm, trying to control your tremor. And you just have to wait for the gun to go. We don't have to worry about anybody else's actions. You know, I'll, I'll go second, try to get us into the race, and we'll put, we'll put to bed this fear that you've got. All the other guys you know, thought it was a good idea, because we figured if he was happy, he'd swim quicker. If he swam quicker, the team would be faster. We'll have a better chance of winning. So we swam the team in this new order. And uh, the first thing that happened was we beat Germany in Germany, which is always nice. Um, or rather, I better clarify that point, just in case you're from Germany. What I mean by that is, it's always nice to be in the home country. Doesn't matter where you're racing. Doesn't matter where you're racing. Whether you're in America, or you're in uh, Australia, or you're in Germany, you want to be in the home country, okay? Because they've got so many people cheering for them. Um, we broke the British record, European record, world record. We are European champions, and only 12 months away from going to Sydney. But like I said before, we always review what you do. You know, and this is again, 
look at the trustees again. Always look, always reviewing what you do, making sure you're going the, the way you want to go. And, uh, and I got the guys together, I said, you all? And everybody was absolutely delighted, everybody except for Matt. I said, Matt, what's the problem? He says, well, you know what? I don't like going first. I said, Matt, there aren't many more options. He said, what's the, what's the problem with going first? He says, well, the thing is, I'm the slowest guy on our team. Consequently, I'm one of the slowest people in the entire race. All other countries, they put suddenly fast out at the beginning, and I dive in, and I can see them all swimming off into the distance, and it puts me off. I'm like, Matt, don't look at them. He says, well, I can't help it. Every time I breathe, I can see them all. He said, look, you have got to block that out. You cannot worry about things you can't control. These guys are going to swim just as quick, regardless of whether you're watching them or not, You've just got to get your head down and do your job as well as you possibly can. How many times have you said that to yourselves? Sometimes I've just got to get my head down and get on with it. And try to forget about those things that I can't influence. Because they're going to happen anyway. I know it's not always possible. But sometimes it's really powerful if you can just block it out. So in fact, Matt, when you go home and you're training at your local pool, I want to imagine you can't even see the other people you train with. I want you to imagine there are black curtains either side of your lane, so that when you breathe, that's all you can see, and you're blocking it out. And just do what you have to do. So yeah, I can work on that. And we all went home to our home program, don't see each other very often, come together once every six weeks or so, do some really practice, and then the rest of the time you are on your own, pretty much, uh, or rather, it feels like you're on your own. I've got a big team around me, doctors, nurses, physios, team managers, coaches, lots of people looking after me. Um, but it sometimes feels lonely. But we were all getting fitter and stronger, got nearer and nearer to Sydney. And then two days before I was due to go, my dad had been my coach when I went to our first games. Had been that, that person who'd been the, you know, supporting me all the way through my, all my treatment. Um, and then he became my number one fan when I went to Barcelona or Atlanta. And then two days before I was due to go, he had a massive stroke. Died out of the blue, he was 57 years old. Absolutely shook me to my core. And I cancelled my flight, and the rest of the team went to Sydney without me. And I went home to help my mum with all that terrible stuff you have to do when somebody near to you dies, and I, I really didn't want to go. But after spending some time at, uh, at home and talking with my mom, we thought, you know what, I had to go, could it not go? My dad would have been so disappointed if he was a reason why I didn't go. So I rebooked my flight, I flew out to Sydney um, the day after his funeral, long flight at the best of times. And when I got there, I suddenly realised the time that I spent getting to know the other guys on the team, you know, really paid back you know, for me. They helped me through this really difficult situation. You know, they knew me well enough to support me. And because and, that wouldn't have happened in the past. In the past, we used to call ourselves a team. Didn't really behave like a team. But these guys really supported me. But of course, when you go to a game, nobody ever says, oh, did you hear about Mark Woods? Should we let Great Britain win? Of course they don't. If anything, they say, did you hear about Mark Woods? We don't need to worry about Great Britain because competition is pretty brutal. So we knew it's, it's going to be difficult, especially just bearing in mind, we're in Australia. There are going to be 15,000 people at the Aquatic Centre in Sydney cheering for Australia. Anybody here from Australia? Oh, it's such a shame. Okay, so uh, <laughs> in a second, I'm going to play another piece of video for you. And the same two rules apply, and you were appalling at rule number one, but you were much better than I thought you were going to be at rule number two. Now, don't wait for the last swimmer before you start cheering, because I go second. Okay? <laughs> I will point it out when I dive in. Can we play the clip, please? Thank you. The men in the pool that many have anticipated here, the four by one of the biggest freestyle for men. And there's the lineup for you. Brazil drawn in one, China in two, Canada in okay, three. Okay, there you choose again. We're in lane four, which means we're the fastest qualifiers. Germany seven, and Russia in lane eight. It'll be interesting to see how the makeup of there's these teams... Rock, just holding on some of his arm, trying to control his tremor. ...on the progress of the event. Four times, two lengths of the pool. Got a guy in the water. Again, he's got a more severe strong. disability yes, than Lee. Are strong. And he's a factory six swimmer. Uh, His team will have some stronger swimmers coming through later on as they make up those 34 points I talked about. So Matt and Great Britain in lane four with four from the top. Matt's wearing the white hand and blue suit. Now what happens when you qualify for a race like this this morning? You have to clear the teams you get to swim that night. So we can see the game plan for all of the countries. We can see that Canada going to put their fastest guy first, second fastest second, first fastest third, slowest guy last. That's their game plan. Australia they're swimming their teams in a more traditional kind of way. Black is far going last. We've got this really weird game plan. I'm sure the rest of the world was looking at it thinking, what are Great Britain doing? With our slowest guy going first, our fastest guy going second. But it worked for us, you know, it, it played to our strengths. So we were comfortable with how it might pan out. So Matt is currently in a different room over there somewhere. That's me getting ready. You might want to get ready yourselves. 
Okay, one, two, three, four, five. Here comes Matt in sixth place. This is Mark Woods. Mark Woods, his father died. Uh, quite okay, recently. get ready. I dive in. Remember, no! Oh, yeah. Excellent. Still leading. Australia up there too. The Chinese. And the first one I do want to dive in is I do a couple of technical checks on the stress. Don't really need to do. It's just good fun to do. And I'm not thinking about anything else. I'm not thinking about the 15,000 people at the Aquatic Centre cheering for Australia. I'm not thinking about the millions of people at home watching on TV. We've got lots of TV coverage this match. I've got from sixth place to fourth of the turn. They call it being in the zone. Have you heard that when athletes get into you the second turn? Oh yeah, man. I was in the zone. Well, I was in the zone this day. It was a little bit like an out-of-body experience. I'm not aware of anything other than doing my job as well as I possibly can. At the end of the day, we've seen Canada. I know I'm not going to catch up this guy, the Canadian guy. So I think all of them should make team. The margin is significant now. But I need to get us back level with Australia. Big advantage for the Canadians. Andrew Haley goes in for. When I get to the end, I've gone from uh, sixth place to equal second. And the first thing I do when I touch the wall is I turn around and I look at the scoreboard. And on the scoreboard, I can see the combined time for myself and for Max. And from that time, I can tell that either we've both done really well or one of us was exceptional. <laughs> no, no, we both done really well. We both done really well. Has an awful um, lot of work to do now. He's and now they're on the ball. I'm looking back across. And I can see they're only just ahead of Australia. I don't think that's a big enough lead because their last guy is definitely faster than our last guy. You can see he's beating Australia, but what sort of game? I'm still not worried about Canada. Even though it's such a long way in the league, I think they're the best from their team. They say this slowest guy at the very end. The guy with the most severe disability. The guy who's not Adam Worthy. He's about to dive in for Canada. The Canadian is going to be Adam Ferdy. The Brazilians are up there in fourth or fifth place with Glasser. He's going in and uh, Brockenshire for Australia. But this is the changeover. And this okay, is Adam Ferdy has got a disability that affects his arms. So what that means is he's faster out of some underwater on his back doing backstroke. That's what makes him a category 6 swimmer. That's why he seemed to do so many points at the front. He's such a long way to leave. He's also well controlled. He had a good chance of catching. So, and all three splits. In the meantime, the final British guy had an incredible relay changeover. Give us a small advantage over Australia. Now this is pretty much the most exciting point of our presentation. I've got any two of them. Now's the time to do it. It's two of them. on the top there. That's brilliant. I mean, I'm, I'm so proud to be part of the British team, part of this team, the swimming team. And first of all, my, my dad died the week I was meant to come out here, and uh, I'm proud to have been his son, and I'm doing it for him. He had a good seat tonight, I think. Absolutely. And David, another gold medal. Awesome. What a team. I mean, we did it. We said we were going to do it, and everything came through on the night. It's a big swim by the last man, everyone was just awesome to him. It was a big swim, Jody, and the crowd were just magnificent. And uh, especially because we beat the Aussies, it's just the, the best bit of it. It's like on that home 
Luke Sword and take the relay on from and a world record by four seconds. Unbelievable. Thank you. I think there were probably millions of people back home thinking, black curtains? <laughs> you know all about it now, and I can honestly say, there is it a better feeling than winning one of these in front of uh, 15,000 people? You can all come and try this on for size if you like. <laughs> if you think it suits you, you've got about three years to get ready. <laughs> Some of you look like you might need longer, but uh, <laughs> I think it's okay to say that. Um, but like I said before, whenever we do anything, we always review what we do. Nobody wins something like that and then thinks, that's great, should we let somebody else do it next time? Because you don't think that was great, I want to do that again. And we went through everything again. And you, you can probably tell that I'm quite a motivated person. And the other people on my team are pretty motivated too. But we began to wonder whether the support team that we had were as motivated as us. You know, I talked about the doctors, nurses, physios, team managers, coaches. Were they all as behind what we were trying to do as we were? So the answer was probably no. Again, I look at the trustees again. You know, you need to think about. You need to think about who who are those people. You know, you know, who who, who did impact on our ability to achieve. Um, we used to have a physiotherapist. Apologists, if you are a physiotherapist. We used to have a physiotherapist who used to take holiday at a really inappropriate moment in time. Early on in our season, where I'm training really hard, um, I, I I've still got competitions to do. I might well have a niggly injury, and they're away on holiday. So I, I don't race or I don't race as well. That wouldn't help. Sometimes a guy did the biomechanic analysis of my swimming technique. You know, tell me how to make the small adjustments to improve. Sometimes they would do that analysis, then leave it on their desk for six weeks before I got taught about it. You know, that's a waste of time. I need to know today if I can get better. Tell me or tell my coach. We need to start working on it right away. And even the guys who put the lane ropes in where I go swimming. Sometimes they would put them in five minutes late and I would miss five minutes of training. It doesn't sound like very much. But if it happens every day, you start thinking to yourself, I bet Australia don't miss five minutes of training every day. And it gets into your head. You don't want that kind of thing in your head. You want to feel as though everybody is doing their job as well as they possibly can to give you the best chance of winning another gold medal. So we did what you guys would call, or what the, what the trustees would understand as, a stakeholder analysis. Who impacts on our ability to achieve? And if you do that properly, it's a surprisingly big group of people. You know, you talk about all these people that you want to influence, you know, to make a difference to diagnosis and prognosis. It will be a massive, massive group of people. And once you understand who they are, you can start having conversations with them. And, and that's what we did. And because of that process of talking to that broader team that supported us, that team went seven seconds quicker in Athens. It was already a world record there. And because of that, I do have another gold medal. <laughs> and uh, it's, it's my last gold medal. And I'm going to finish... We one final story before before I think we got might have a little bit of time for questions for me. I don't know yet. Yeah, we have a panel. Yes. Oh, we have a panel. Oh, fine. Save them for the panel then. Um, uh, now you throw me now. You throw me now. Okay, we're going to rewrite what I'm going to say now. Um, so uh, this is the last race that I ever did, and uh, when I when I retired, I went back to my local swimming pool. I mean, I went to Beijing as a commentator for the BBC, did the same thing in London, but this is the last race that I ever did. And um, I went back to my local pool and I bumped into a guy in the reception area of the swimming pool and he came up to me and he said, uh, Mark, I saw the Paralympics on TV, it looked fantastic, didn't it? I said, absolutely brilliant. And then he said, um, and your, uh, the swimming team, they looked like they did a great job. I said, oh, they absolutely did a fantastic job. I said, and your relay team, what a team. I'm part of that team, aren't I? It's like, yes, you are. Do you know what his job was? To make sure the water was clean in my pool. To make sure the lane ropes went in on time. He understood. If he did his job as well as he possibly could, he gave me a better chance of winning another gold medal. You know, and those amputees out here will know that there's a bunch of guys who can make your leg work, you know, and, and feel right. They all need to be doing it as well as they, they can. I couldn't believe it when he said it to me. I wish I could have snapped a piece of this off and given it to him there and then. Could he deserved it? And obviously I didn't. <laughs> it's very easy to say that, isn't it? But I did, um, 
I did make sure. I did make sure that he, he understood that I really appreciated all the hard work that he put in over a four year period of time. Um, I hope, I hope you've enjoyed what I've talked about. I, I, I guess I'm a big believer in, in taking personal responsibility for you know, where you're heading and you know, choosing to be as good as you can be at whatever it is you want to do. And I hope you guys will do the same. Uh, I hope you all spend a bit of time thinking about um, who can help you do that. Because it's often a lot easier and you'd be a lot more successful if you really think about who supports you and who's on your team and working together towards it. And I just want to finish with, um, because we're doing questions from the panel, I'm going to finish my favourite ever question, if that's okay. Um, and I only ever get asked this when I go and do a talk at a primary school. And you'll understand why when I tell you what the question is. Like to be disabled. Now isn't that a great question? Only a seven-year-old will ask you that question. I will hang on a second. Let me ask you two questions. First of all, who is the most disabled person in this room? Let's say, well, you are, you've got one leg. Okay, fine. Kids are great, aren't they? That's fine. Uh, and then, then I'll say, right, now, who is the fastest swimmer in this room? They'll say, well, you are, you've got a gold medal. I'm like, fine. So who's disabled at swimming, me or you? And you can see them all go, oh my God, I'm disabled. <laughs> but the point that I'm trying to make is that disability is relative to the task we are all good at some things, and we're all not so good, or disabled, other things. And what I'm trying to get these young people to think about, and which you guys understand better than most people that I talk to, is that you don't judge people by the one thing that they can't do. You judge them by the thousand things that they can do. Thank you very much. <laughs>